Okay, there's a reason why I'm in print media, not uh, broadcast stuff, because you have to deal with little things like this. Oops, it's not going to work. Can you help me? Will it work on the necklace? Is it on? Okay, is that what I was supposed to do? It's not on. It's not on. Clip it on. Clip it on. Can I do that? There. How's that? Okay, well, now get settled here. Well, the Pulitzer Prize winner, that, that sounds really good to me. <laughs> um, and what Kim was saying about um, entering contests and editors like to do that such uh, thing and reporters can uh, say that it doesn't matter to them and that's not why they're in the business and, and all of that, but it's real nice when you win, just like Kim said. Uh, a month ago today, the Des Moines Register won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service and the time since then has been an absolute whirlwind um, with the excitement of that and also with another wave of media attention because of the subject of our project uh, which has suddenly been drawn back into the national media with the events in Florida concerning William Kennedy Smith. So my phone has been ringing off the wall with requests uh, for profound comments uh, and invitations to speak at all sorts of places and I have declined almost all of those. Um, this is kind of fun to say that I have uh, not accepted invitations to Face the Nation, CNN Crossfire, CBS This Morning, Inside Edition, Entertainment Tonight, um, <laughs> a radio program in Dallas, uh, speaking engagements in Minneapolis, Atlanta, Charleston, South Carolina, an all expense paid weekend in Montreal, Canada, which I may want to reconsider. <laughs> um, but as I told Marianne Odom um, when she invited me, I accepted the invitation here to San Antonio because I like to talk to journalism students. I just finished a semester of associate teaching at Drake University School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I love doing that. The students think that I'm pretty tough because I'm picky about things such as spelling and grammar and punctuation and accuracy. Uh, I don't suppose you have that here. <laughs> but I really like talking with journalism uh, students because here we can talk about ideals. The way newspapering should be, where in the fast pace of the real newsroom, sometimes that gets blurred. A little over 14 months ago, the Des Moines Register printed a story that it thought was a good and important story. It was an account of the traumatic experience of Nancy Ziegenmeyer, a victim of rape. We anticipated a strong reaction to our five-part series, but never in our wildest dreams did we envision the national and even worldwide attention that the project has received for over a year. Just yesterday, I was interviewed by a Japanese TV news program about the story. I've lost count of the number of rape crisis centers and other media that informed us of the positive effect our project had on their own similar efforts. For that, I feel enormous gratification. Still, the making of our story was not without problems that the journalism world needs to look at. For those of you who would uh, like to take an opportunity for a little nap right now, that's okay, because a lot of what I am going to be saying tonight uh, will be contained in a story that I've written for the Washington Journalism Review, which will be coming out in a couple weeks. A lot of the same thoughts that I have um, uh, decided were important to talk about in regard to the Register's Rape Series. 
The Florida case that's in the news uh, involves the question of whether the media should use a rape victim's name without her permission. My personal opinion on that situation is that no, the media should not be printing rape victims' names without permission. I too dream of a day when the stigma has been eased enough that uh, we can reach that point. But from my experience and what I have learned through this project, I don't think we're ready yet. It, it's going to take a lot more time before uh, we are to that point. But I want to talk about another situation tonight. What about issues of privacy when a rape victim gives permission to use her name? In the past year, I've had the opportunity to talk with many other journalists who were following suit Something clicked. You don't want to miss one of my comments. Sure. Okay. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk with journalists from all over the country who were following suit in doing stories about rape victims in their own locality. Some of the common problems that they have relayed to me are immensely troubling. I would like to share some of these conversations with you. Late last summer, an angry young female reporter from New York State called me. She was furious at whom she called her male chauvinist editors because they were reluctant to print the rape victim's story she had written. It seemed that a man had been arrested and charged with acquaintance rape but the grand jury there failed to return an indictment against him, and so the man was released. The woman who had allegedly been raped was so angry and frustrated that she decided to tell her story to the newspaper, just as that woman in Iowa had done. The reporter, in her eagerness to expose what she deemed to be a grave injustice done to the rape victim, intended to use the name of the alleged assailant and explain how politics had influenced the grand jury's decision and allowed this criminal to go free. She seemed to me determined to try, convict, and hang the man on her own. I asked her if she had considered that she might be setting herself and her newspaper up for charges of libel from the accused man. She fell silent. In her immense sympathy for the rape victim, she apparently had lost sight of the other side of the story. I don't know all the details of that case, but if the grand jury failed to indict the man, I think that the reporter should at least entertain the idea that he might be innocent. Better yet, the reporter could refrain from playing judge and jury. Our newfound respect sympathy and compassion for courageous rape victims must not keep us as journalists from practicing fairness to both sides in reporting. Another call was from a female reporter in Burlington, Vermont. Having heard about what was done in Iowa, a rape victim there had come forward to tell a rather incredible story. After working on the project for some time, the reporter called me obviously upset. This woman is spilling out her guts to me, the reporter told me. I feel like I want to help her, to accommodate her in any way that I can. My question is, how far do we bend the rules in writing the stories of rape victims? Bend the rules? Is that what we're going to do? We as journalists have already made a practice of treating rape victims differently by not printing their names without permission. But now, if a woman does give her permission to the media to report her name, are we going to treat her to a special set of rules? Any decent reporter should, of course, approach the subject with particular sensitivity. But if we begin breaking the basic rules of information gathering and reporting, we would be giving the control of the story to our news source. What if, for example, Mary Jones gives permission to have her name printed immediately after reporting her rape to the police. Would Joe, the reporter, go back to the newsroom and type into the story, Mary Jones was raped? Or would he treat the rape victim as he presumably would any other news source and give the reader additional information about her? Would he say that Mary Jones was a teacher at East High School or was a member of the governor's staff? or was a sister to a prominent businessman in town? 
or would he simply say the victim was Mary Jones? I believe that there is an enormous difference between naming the name of a rape victim and telling who the victim is. But how much is too much? In the Florida rape case, the New York Times has taken enormous criticism for printing too much about the alleged victim. Consider the dilemma we faced in our own project. In the seven months of working with Nancy Ziegenmeyer on our project, the only conversation I have on tape is our very first meeting. At that time, I asked a lot of general questions of Nancy, her age, occupation, kids, and so forth. I also inquired about her marriage to Steve Ziegenmeyer. She told me they had been married since June of 1981, that it was the first marriage for each of them, that neither had ever been through a divorce, that they had a wonderfully strong marriage. Sometime later, Nancy admitted to me that the information was not truthful. In fact, she and Steve had had a rocky relationship and had been divorced in 1988. They later reconciled, but had never legally remarried. She asked me to keep that information out of the newspaper. I told her we couldn't do that, but I took the matter to my editors, who decided that since the Ziegenmeyers probably had what could be called a common law marriage, we would not address the matter and could call Steve Ziegenmeyer Nancy's husband. I would rather have offered a one paragraph explanation that would have gently dealt with the marriage situation, but I was happy that my source was appeased. Still, in writing the story, I was uncomfortable enough with the situation that I never once called Steve Ziegenmeyer Steve Ziegenmeyer Nancy's husband. I never said they were married. Of course, the reader assumes that they had a marital type relationship, and that in itself was not inaccurate. But I wish now that we had done it differently. In any case, look where that incident left me, the reporter. Well into the project, I began to wonder what I really knew about my news source. I could check out the story of the rape with the police department or the courthouse, but what did I really know about Nancy Ziegenmeyer? Remember, this woman had come to us and volunteered a remarkable story. We didn't find her, we didn't seek her out on a tip. Knowing a source had already provided untruthful information once, how many reporters and editors would be willing to put her story on the front page of your newspaper under your byline for five days in a row without checking her out further? On the other hand, here we have a rape victim from small town Iowa. She has told only a few people about her rape. I know that if a reporter for the Des Moines Register walks into Grinnell, Iowa and starts asking questions, the story will be all over town by noon. And remember, the only reason I drew this assignment in the first place was because it was felt I could handle it with sensitivity. I was in a real jam. I needed the trust of my news source if I wanted this story to work. But more than that, I sincerely respected her privacy. I was not willing to betray that. Eventually, I was able to discreetly tap into the small town grapevine and check out my source. Unfortunately, the information I gathered, some public record and some opinion, was quite disturbing. Enough so, in fact, that I questioned whether to continue the project. The register editors and I discussed the matter at length. We decided that our story was about the trauma experienced by a victim of rape. We decided that the information I had gathered regarding the rape victim's background was irrelevant to our story. Therefore, we chose not to print it. Ironically, Nancy did not realize until after our series was published, after it had been well received nationwide, that I in fact knew more about her than what she had told me and what we had printed. Much to my disappointment, she expressed to me that she was extremely angry. I trusted you, Jane, she said, and you had no right to go behind my back and check me out. Well, I disagree. Uh, as a reporter, I believe I not only had a right to do so, but an obligation. We must not let our newfound respect, sympathy, and compassion for courageous rape victims lead us to bend the rules of responsible reporting. 
The third conversation that I hold as particularly important began with a phone call from a former reporter in North Carolina. She told me that our story reminded her of one she had read years ago, and she sent me a copy of the clip that she had saved. One of the things that has bothered me in all the publicity about our series is the idea that it is a first. Nancy Ziegenmeyer was indeed very courageous in allowing us to tell her story. But if our project leaves a mark in journalism history, as some people have predicted, let it not be said that, it, that she was the first woman ever to tell her story, and let it not be said that the Register was the first paper ever to publish such a thing. Rather, let it mark the point where, for the first time, American society appeared ready and willing to listen. I'll tell you why I feel this way. The reporter from North Carolina sent me her clip. It showed that almost a decade ago, a freelance writer wrote the story of her own rape, and the story was printed in the opinion section of a major newspaper. It was a devastating story. I could not help but wonder about the author. While we in Iowa basked in accolades for our accomplishment, what had become of this other courageous rape victim who spoke out years ago? So, like a good reporter, I tracked her down. Yes, she said she had heard what was going on in Iowa, and I asked her to tell me about the reaction from her story compared to ours. She broke down in tears on the telephone. It was awful, she said. She was criticized and chastised by family, friends, and strangers. She felt forced to leave her job. Her marriage broke up. She regretted ever choosing to speak out. I told her I wanted to write about the difference between what we were experiencing and the experience of a rape victim who had spoken out before the world was ready to hear. She agreed to work with me, and I then sat down and wrote a rather excellent opinion piece on the subject. The next day, however, the woman called back and said she had changed her mind. She didn't want to be in my story. She didn't want to relive the ordeal. Does your paper have a policy of not printing a rape victim's name if she doesn't want you to, she asked me. And I said, we did. Then I don't want you to use my name, she said. A follow-up letter from her reinforced that position. Now what are we supposed to do with this? Here we have a previously unidentified rape victim, Nancy Ziegenmeyer, making national news for agreeing to be identified while a previously identified rape victim refuses to let me use her name again. What happens then if next month or 10 years from now, Nancy Ziegenmeyer tells us she doesn't want her name printed as a rape victim? Who is writing down the rules as we go along in this? My follow-up story was eventually killed because without the other woman's name, it lacked credibility. It has become apparent to me over the past year that the story we thought was a good and important project, and which indeed appears to have accomplished some good in increasing awareness regarding the subject of rape, has also served as a catalyst for a number of disturbing turns of events. One of the many publications that has featured our project in its own story is Good Housekeeping, which happens to be one of my favorite magazines. But the article they ran was very upsetting to me. I wrote to the author of the piece, but did not receive a response. I asked her if she had talked to any other source for her story besides Nancy Ziegenmeyer. It would appear that she did not. The article refers to Steve Ziegenmeyer as, quote, Nancy's husband of nine years, which we already know to be inaccurate. It tells of the conditions Nancy set forth before agreeing to give the register her story. Had the author talked to the register's editor or myself, we would have disputed that information. It tells of Nancy's affiliation with the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Those people tell me that had the author talked to their office, they would probably have clarified the matter that she is not connected with them. It frightens me to see how fast things are moving and how carelessly some reporters are publishing facts. Greg Barton, publisher of the Survivor magazine in Knoxville, Tennessee, 
has talked to me several times and was able to give me some valuable insight into the situation. Barton holds a degree in psychology and is himself a rape victim having been assaulted as a teenager by a group of older boys. His publication, as the name would imply, is about and for rape survivors. He routinely deals with rape victims who tell their stories for publication. He told me that it is becoming increasingly difficult to find people willing to talk about sexual abuse out of the genuine desire to help others. He spoke mostly of professional people and victims who have been influenced by invitations to TV programs or monetary offers from movie producers. Rape victims have been nameless, faceless people for so long, Barton told me, that they are desperate for a role model to attach themselves to. They will grasp at any possibility. My heart goes out to that man and to all the rape victims who have suffered so terribly. But Barton agrees that they don't need my sympathy. They don't need our sympathy as journalists. What those people need from us is sensitivity and compassion, but also fair and accurate reporting. We must not let our newfound respect for courageous straight victims lead us to forget those things. In the past year, in the wake of our series about a victim of rape, the register has changed its official policy regarding reporting of rape victims' names twice. We went from never printing names to offering victims a choice of whether or not to have their names used. The public misunderstood our intentions and thought that we were going to begin arbitrarily printing names. The result was a public relations fiasco for the register. And Iowa legislators promised to introduce a bill to seal police records so the media had no access to any names of rape victims um, until a police report had been made. On Monday of this week, that bill was narrowly defeated. We changed our policy once more in the fall and now will not attempt to contact rape victims immediately after the crime to give them a choice of having their name printed but to approach them later on at another point of newsworthiness to give them a choice. If they agree to have their name published, we will do so with an explanation to our readers that they did give permission. If they do not give us permission, we will certainly not print their name. The past year has been a very difficult learning experience for me. And I don't regret the opportunity to work on the rape victim story. But my concern now, especially in the wake of the, the Florida situation, is that journalists need to slow down. We need to be careful about what we're doing and let society take time, a decade or a generation, to change the stigma of rape. From my experience, I've discovered that this uncharted ground that we have dared to enter is in fact a minefield. I suggest to you, my friends and colleagues, that we as journalists would do well to walk it carefully. Okay, that is the end of my stiff and formal remarks. And I appreciate your attentiveness. I <laughs> thanks. Now the better part is, uh, I understand this is appropriate, is uh, if there are some questions and some discussion about this subject. Mm -hmm. What about uh, revealing the names of the alleged assailant? How do you feel about that? Uh, that troubles me a great deal and in the Florida case that in particular is what um, bothered me that the media was protecting the alleged victim's name uh, while the alleged assailant uh, was was being broadcast all over. Um, I had an opportunity to visit with an editor of a newspaper from I believe North Carolina um, or at least uh, one of the southern type states there. He was telling me 
that they changed their policy at their newspaper to withhold both the name of the uh, woman, the rape victim, and the name of the accused assailant. And the first time that they had a chance to apply that uh, new policy was in a case where they had a white woman who allegedly had been raped by a black man. They withheld both names, and when the case went to trial, the man was equi acquitted. And the judge told the newspaper editor afterwards that that was incredible for a black man to be acquitted in a southern state like that, and that he felt wholeheartedly that the only way that man got a fair trial was um, because the newspaper did not print the assailant's name. So I think uh, there's room for some uh, thought and discussion of that possibility. We're, uh, it, it, it's not fair uh, to one person to have the name protected if we're printing the other one. Another very heart-wrenching letter came from a father of a young man who was a college student who had been accused of rape by his date and uh, his name was all over the newspapers, and uh, it seems that he was an outstanding student or an athlete or something, and his picture was in the paper, and uh, in the end, the charges were dropped. And the woman's name was never revealed, but his reputation was ruined. He eventually had to leave the school and start over somewhere else. Uh, is that fair? You said there's a difference between naming the name of the victim and then telling who that victim is. Mm -hmm. I believe so. In the case of the uh, New York job rape case mm -hmm. a few years ago, how, where, we knew everything but her name. Where do we draw the line? Well, see, that's what we have to uh, determine. Uh, also in the, the Florida case, we knew so much about that woman that the name actually was a technicality. Um, which is, I think, part of the reason why it does not trouble me uh, an awfully lot that the New York Times and NBC and the Des Moines Register uh, use that woman's name because uh, the circumstances of that case uh, had become such that she could have been identified by other means. Um, we have to decide this. We, we journalists have to work through this. We have to decide how much is relevant uh, in reporting a, a rape victim's name. If, if there was a victim of uh, burglary, uh, someone's home was robbed and the person was shot and it was in the newspaper, uh, and that person had something about their background that would be relevant to your readers, would we print it? Well, yeah, <laughs> usually we would. Um, but do we do that with rape victims? We haven't really gotten that far to think about that. We're, we've been so hung up on just the fact, uh, just the issue of naming a name, that we haven't stopped to talk about what else we're going to print after we print the name, if it comes to that. Mm -hmm. uh, could you clarify spelling of Zygmunt? Yeah, isn't that a good one? Um, Ziegenmeier, Z-I-E-G-E-N-M-E-Y-E-R. We had a lot of fun uh, with that. The, the three women involved in this project were Nancy Ziegenmeier, Geneva Overholzer, and Jane Shore, which has an unusual spelling. So, but the, the rapist name was Bobby Smith, so that was pretty easy. <laughs> Once one publication is, has published a name, should other publications be able to publish it freely, as happened in Florida, where they said, hey, somebody else published it, you know, so we just, should, should they be able to do that? Um, I really wish that the, the Florida uh, situation had never happened. Um, and any any assault is regrettable, but this one and the timing of it, I think is most unfortunate um, Everyone has linked that event with the fact that the Des Moines Register just won a public service award for a story that names uh, a victim's name. And actually, uh, there's no connection. There's, it's apples and oranges because in our case, uh, we had the victim's permission. 
the purpose of our story was something else. It was uh, it was a different project altogether. Um, and and the reason I uh, preface my answer with all of that is because um, I, I wish people wouldn't use the Florida case as uh, a classic example of what we're talking about in rape coverage. I don't think it is. I think it's an exception to almost every rule because you've got a high profile um, a person being accused of the rape. Um, it got all mixed up, you know, with this tabloid uh, doing their sensational stunt. Um, there a lot of fuzzy um, information there until uh, today or yesterday there were not even any charges filed I mean it went for how long since Easter Sunday without even any charges filed I don't think that case uh, is a good example of what the media issue is all about because we're talking about in any given town whether to print rape victims' names in your community from your police station's uh, blotter. And the 99.99% are not going to be a high profile case with lots of extenuating circumstances. So in, in the Florida case, um, I wish that the Globe had never printed the name. I wish that um, the other media had not followed suit. Um, the fact that they did um, doesn't worry me as much as some other things. Um, I wish that it had never happened. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't, the issue of names aside, you didn't tell us um, a lot about the reasons for the registers printing this series, the, the compelling material about the, mm -hmm. the woman's experience, and I'd like to hear a little bit okay. about that. Sure. Um, I don't know if you know the background or not. Uh, how our story came to be was the Register's editor, Geneva Overholzer, had written an opinion piece um, that talked about the media's policy of not naming rape victims' names. And in her opinion piece, she said um, that this is the way it was and probably would remain, um, but she wished that it weren't so. She wished that the stigma of rape uh, would be lessened so that we could talk freely about it and in fact that she thought the solution to having the stigma be erased was for people to talk openly about it. And the opinion piece ran without any fanfare at all. Um, about three weeks later uh, one of our readers in Grinnell, Iowa who was a rape victim called up um, Geneva's office and asked if she could come and talk to Geneva about the philosophy of that opinion piece. And so Nancy Ziegemeyer came in to talk and from that conversation um, apparently Nancy made a decision that she would be willing to talk about her experience and she said something to the effect of if you really believe that this will do some good uh, in educating people, in increasing awareness, then I will be willing to tell my story. So that's how it came about. And at that time, we did not know it was going to be any big deal. It was another newspaper assignment, an, a, another day's work. And uh, I happened to draw the assignment and uh, was given a slip of paper with Nancy Ziegemeyer's uh, name and phone number and told I was supposed to call this woman and that's about as much as I knew about it. What happened was that um, in Nancy's story the legal proceedings, the trial against her assailant was delayed over and over and over again uh, through some red tape in the legal system and because of that my working experience with uh, Nancy uh, stretched out into about seven months time and the more I got to know her the more I talked to her and she was in a, a small town outside of Des Moines about 50 miles from Des Moines so we talked on the telephone all the time I only saw her um, from the first time that I met her in August until the the trial in January um, I only saw her in person one time uh, all of our conversations were over the phone and we talked, uh, we fell into a pattern of talking like 
two friends would like you pick up the phone and, and call a girlfriend or, and we talked about a lot of other things besides uh, rape and uh, what was going on with her trial and that's how I came up with um, some of the detail in the story that evolved into a portrait of a real live human being um, People have asked me, what did you hope to accomplish by doing this big project? Well, it wasn't out on the drawing board as that. We did not think we were going to uh, do this and it's going to be a major sensation. Uh, the, the intent was that it would help educate people. But it was not until the trial got over, the man was convicted, I sat down to write the story I had so much information over seven months' time that uh, it was decided to make it into a series rather than a one article. And what I thought was just my um, ongoing flaw of getting emotionally involved in my stories um, turned out to have the same effect on uh, the people who read the story. It was. Uh, reading about another human being who has been through a very painful experience. We had no idea that it was going to cause uh, a big sensation. And we've been uh, scratching our heads for 14 months to figure out exactly why it uh, had the effect it did on people. I think perhaps um, a big part is timing. We didn't know this but it seems that we have reached the point where it's time to talk about this. I give long answers, don't I? Mm -hmm. How much discussion went into um, a concern over perpetuating a stereotype because uh, she was white and the rapist was white? That was a real concern of ours. We were afraid we would get a lot of criticism uh, about that. And so uh, before the story was published, the editors went through and uh, took out any uh, unnecessary reference to uh, rape, at, uh, I'm sorry, to race at all. Um, it happened that some of the assailants' comments uh, during the attack uh, had racial implications, and, and that was a part of the story, so we had to put uh, that in. Um, but we tried very, very hard to not make that an issue. And in a column by the editor that accompanied the first day's installment, uh, she pointed out that the mixed race attack was in fact an exception to the rule. And uh, in the end, we did not get a lot of criticism. We got a little bit. But, but not very much. It did not turn out to be the, the issue that we thought it might. Mm -hmm. That's it? Mm -hmm. Having heard from a lot of rape crisis centers, which I imagine you have, is the consensus that this type of reporting is worthwhile and should be done? The, um, yes. Uh, we received many, many calls from rape victims, and this is nationwide, um, and also from rape counselors. And the consensus across the board is that our project um, did some good in, in opening some eyes about rape. However, there was also some observations made, and, and I really uh, agree with these observations, from rape counselors that, you know, um, the woman in your story is not a typical rape victim. Her, her case is not a typical situation. Because um, of the, the <coughs> racial thing, for starters, because she was attacked by a stranger, whereas 80% or something like that of, of rapes are acquaintance rapes, um, because she was not uh, badly hurt in the sense that she was not shot or stabbed or beaten or, or anything like that, um, because her 
assailant was arrested and convicted and is in prison for life with no chance of parole and many uh, or I don't know if I can say most, I, I don't know the statistics, but many, many uh, victims, assailants are, are never caught. Uh, because Nancy Ziegemeyer received restitution from the college uh, who owned the parking lot from which she was abducted and attacked, uh, she received a, a very nice settlement from them. Uh, so her case uh, was not your typical rape, and um, I acknowledge that. Uh, criticism from journalists across the country has been that the register's rape was the perfect rape. It was neat and tidy, and she was totally, uh, obviously innocent, and it made for a real convenient story, and I would agree with that. I don't know that our story would have had the impact uh, that it did if the woman in the story had uh, left a bar with a man that she met and then was raped. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in, in your opening comments your reluctance to um, appear on, on different national interviews for TV. What's your reason for that? The <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, it's a real hassle, you know. Uh, I've only got about two good dresses, and... Uh, <laughs> um, and they have to be the right Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, what I have told a lot of these people um, is that I am not an expert on rape. I'm a feature writer for the Des Moines Register. I wrote one assignment about a rape victim, and suddenly uh, became something of an authority on this and have spent the past year of my life answering questions that I don't know the answers to. Uh, what's the right thing for journalists to do? What do you think about the, the, what the New York Times did? Well, who cares what I think? I don't know uh, about that. There are, there are other people out there uh, who are more learned um, about all the aspects of journalism and certainly uh, more people out there who know about the aspects of rape. The psychologists, the counselors, the law enforcement people, the rape victims themselves. Um, so I'm not an expert and, and I refuse to pretend to be. I know what I've experienced in our own project and I've learned a great deal. Um, also, it seems to me back in journalism school there was something mentioned about reporters are supposed to report the news and not be in the news. Mm -hmm. and, and I really believe that. I do, not, um, I do not want to go the talk show circuit. I am uh, I'm trying to do uh, some things locally. I mean, when the Kiwanis Club calls up, well, okay, <laughs> uh, for PR purposes, uh, I better go do that. Um, and some opportunities that that are quite self-serving, you know, I, I think might be good experience for me or, or be good opportunities for me, I'll do. And um, as I said before, I, I really believe this. I think that groups of journalists need to be talking about this. So in the past year, the, the three... Three out of four trips that I've made have been to uh, groups of journalists, uh, investigative reporters um, meeting in Detroit and the Columbia, Missouri School of Journalism and here and the Phil Donahue Show. But most of them were, were journalists. The, the Phil Donahue Show is kind of a funny story. Um, we were besieged with requests from all over after our series ran and the register decided right away that we did not want to come across as exploiting our project and so at that time we turned down most everything. Uh, Nancy Ziegenmeyer made different choices and she certainly has that right but um, she, she is a personality who really enjoys attention and uh, she accepted almost everything that, that came along. The one thing that she wanted to do desperately was be on the Phil Donahue show uh, because she idolizes the man and they hadn't called and so her uh, attorney 
I finally called up the producers and said, uh, you know, don't you want Nancy Ziegemeyer on your show? And uh, so they looked at um, our work, I guess they faxed them uh, the series or something, and they said, okay, we want uh, this subject on our show, but since Ziegemeyer has been on so much other stuff, we don't want just her, we want her and that reporter. And uh, so Nancy wanted to be on it so badly, and I knew that she did. I knew how much uh, she idolized Phil Donahue. So the register people talked it over and decided that, okay, we'd make this one um, exception. And they sent me to New York to be on Phil Donahue. And, um, you know, it was an interesting experience. It was good for the register um, because he raved on and on about the series. And uh, they didn't ask me too many questions, so I didn't have a chance to, you know, make too much of a fool of myself. And um, I got some souvenirs, um, and uh, Phil Donahue uh, gave me a big smooch on the forehead. And, <laughs> and, you know, so that's fun. That's something that I can, can tell my grandkids about. But for the most part, we did not want to be on the, the talk show uh, circuit, and I still don't. I really... Um, as much as possible, want to get back to a normal lifestyle. I don't know, it's still going on. Um, I don't know whether I'll ever get back to what I was doing before, writing stories about gardening and, and how to care for your shoes and, and personality profiles for the feature, feature pages. Maybe, maybe that's gone um, forever. I am getting calls lots and lots of calls from people uh, with um, social issue problems. Can you help me with this? And it breaks my heart. But there's some good stories in there. Um, I wrote a story last fall about the epidemic of uh, wife battering in rural Iowa. It was totally frustrating. It was so hard. People wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't give me their names. They didn't want to go on record. Um, I finally got it into the newspaper, and I swore that um, I would never do that again. I, I was done with social issues. I was not going to save the world. Um, and then it happened that there was a letter to the editor in response to, to that story that, if I can find it, it, it meant a lot to me. Um, I don't suppose I can find it now. It was from the Attorney General of the state of Iowa. And he said in his letter to the editor um, something to the effect of uh, Jane Shore's story about rural domestic abuse um, hopefully will change, will be the beginning of a change of attitude in our state towards this problem. If there is any justice, that will be the outcome. And I thought, wow. And I thought, well, maybe there is more to this profession than, than earning my crummy little paycheck. Maybe uh, uh, the media is, is so powerful. You hear about the power of the press and make jokes about it. Uh, but it's absolutely true. The, the media, in all forms, is so powerful. And if we are a part of that, we've got a unique opportunity to make a difference. And I don't have enough energy to save the world, um, but if I can do the best job that I can, and if it makes a difference, then uh, it is an enormously gratifying feeling whether they hand me a Pulitzer Prize for public service or not. Are we out of time? Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me on this one. <laughs> well, now we've got the same thing in reverse. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't get to wear that.